later. I don't know how long y'all are here today, but I could show you the chestnut area too. Oh yeah. See, that'd be awesome. Cause it's young yeah. too, but I think yeah. it's going to be cool. And we're doing a lot of, you know, yeah. grazing and. Okay. Do you want to just do it right now? Maybe then? we should do it now. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So how many, um, how many trees do you have planted? Oh, uh, we have maybe around 40 trees right now. Okay. So we've been, we kind of add to it when our friend Hill Craddock, the chestnut researcher, oh, yeah. when he like, a lot of times he just has leftover trees and that, so he, whenever he gives us trees, we plant them. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The, um, other chestnut orchard, the growers that I was speaking with, they were just talking about how it's really great because you don't have to plant a lot of them and you get so much production. Right. Um, I know, they get big. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's really cool and that they're super nutrient dense. So yeah. good for people and for forage. Yeah. And we also grow shiitake mushrooms like on a really small scale, but which oh, we've cool. always used uh, oak trees kind of around the edges of the pastures, but he'll, you know, his, his wife's from Italy and they're really into, you know, the, there's like the Italian systems where they plant, like they plant clumps of chestnuts, like mm. really close together. And then they let, you know, they let them get big enough for mushroom production, the logs, and then oh, they'll like cool. cut all the trees, except essentially they go in and thin them out and then yeah. leave one tree spaced however far apart for nut production. That's awesome. I know. So we've kind of done that. We have some clumps of trees that just, we'll see what happens. But yeah. Okay. I'll get this. I think, yeah, this is good that we didn't take the van. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't take the van across. <laughs> yeah, this is also where we have our, our campsite and swimming hole area, which is... Oh, cool, so people like, can stay on the farm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and this the spring fed river is what like that's how we survive summer in Tennessee. Oh yeah, I bet. <laughs> okay, this is yeah. <laughs> So this, this we smoothed this out, but this turns into like a raging floodwaters. Uh this, oh, yeah. so that's why like every year we have to do work to this to get to to where we can actually drive across it. So it's, which I haven't I've started smoothing it out like twice with the tractor this spring and every time the next week it let me have a flood because <laughs> oh, yeah. it's rained so much. Yeah. So yeah, we have all these pastures over here like basically on an island because the, the river That's splits so cool. and goes around. Yeah. Um, so like right here, awesome. this I, was, I think I mentioned to you, I've been like mowing around where like trees volunteer so like yeah. those are all persimmons right there yeah that, that's so cool i feel like this area especially like with the whole diversified food forest thing i mean you guys the wild plants you have here are awesome i mean yeah. but the fact that persimmons grow wild is so yeah see that's cool. a mature persimmon tree right there which wow. basically these are all just it's babies yeah um, and then we have a lot of Ooh. black walnuts too that cool I mean like that that's a black walnut those are those are black walnuts those that's big awesome. trees and so we have some say all these little sprouts yeah so see in a few that's kind of what I'm thinking like in a you know in several years all of our pastures will look kind of like that have like big trees scattered yeah because um, why not yeah totally I think and <clears throat> in terms of um, holding water, I mean, a tree, just having a few trees can yeah, make a huge roots. difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and our, we have really sandy soil here because it's, it's literally just all like old river bottom. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so here, here's the chestnut area. And so like the sheep, we just graze the sheep all through here. So how old are, um, how old are these trees? Um, I don't know exactly. They're probably like five, five years old or something like that. Cool. I mean, you can see how they're, I think they're going to produce something. Uh, yeah. They're, they're flowering. So, 
Um, that's exciting. So yeah, that's kind of like, see how we planted this like cluster right yeah. here. That's kind of what Hill had recommended. And then, and then, you know, eventually we'll select just one of these trees out of this cluster. Okay. Um, the deer came in and were rubbing on the trees and then they sent up all these sprouts. And what Hill said, like, like that one we pruned, but he said also you can just let these sprouts shoot up and that actually, you know, like this is the original stem, mm -hmm. but like one of these new sprouts actually might become the dominant, like uh. become a more aggressive grower mm -hmm. and then you'll come in and cut all the other ones out. So that's the other thing they do in Italy is that they'll, even a big tree, you know, they let these sprouts grow up and just for the log, mushroom log production. And then you cut it and they just keep re-sprouting. Yeah. It's a pretty cool tree. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Very multi-purposeful. Yeah. Which is awesome. I mean, maybe even in, another, you know, in, even in one, one to two more years, we'll probably get a decent crop. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I've, that's what I've been hearing is kind of five years is when they start producing. Yeah. And then 11 years is like the magic number, I guess. When so they're really cranking. They, yeah. 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 We got a, we had a few, a few chestnuts last year. So it's a work in progress. I feel like it's really cool that it's growing right now. And I don't know. I think maybe some people see it as a potential downside that you, it's like a long term investment. But right. at the end of the day, compared to, I think, a lot of other growing systems, you can do a lot in a small area and have quite a bit of production. Yeah. And I mean, like, that's the beauty of growing something that's perennial is you put it in and then you just watch it grow. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the thing, too, for us, like, we're already, we're doing the same thing. We're using it for the same thing that we were anyway, which was the sheep, you know, grazing right. the pastures for the sheep. Yeah. And it only is added benefit just having shade for yeah. them. So it's right. like, so we're not just like waiting just on the trees to become productive. Yeah. Um, and just putting them in there is improving soil health. Grazing sheep in here is improving soil health. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. our goal for it's all, all, all of our pastures is to have a lot more trees. Yeah. It's really in Tennessee, like our extreme season is the summer. Um, yeah. You know, winters are pretty mild. That for livestock particularly, like the summer is when they're the most stressed. You know, anytime you have a shade tree, that's where all the animals are. So it's like having having the shade trees more dispersed throughout the pasture is just gonna be good way better for animal welfare. Mm. And it would then distribute that manure a lot better, totally, you know, yeah. from them hanging out in the shade. I'd really hope we can um come back maybe when they're a little older and then I mean I'm excited because I think we can kind of get in when everything's starting and growing and seeing how everything improves over time as the trees age right that's like kind of ideal so what our main goal of the study is is to determine to determine how managing life on farms is benefiting the farming operation and the ecosystem as a whole I think that to come back here, to start at the beginning and see, okay, you're planting trees, you're increasing life here. To see how that grows over time and how that ultimately builds all the other parts of life that are happening on this plot of land. You know, your microbial community in your soil, the beneficial insects that will come from this, the mushrooms, I mean, all of it's interconnected. And to, I think, to foster one form of life is fostering 10 more. Um, so being able to measure that as everything's growing is ultimately would be the goal. And then along with that, you know, the other half of this is we were caring about farmer well-being and how we can make the farm profitable and viable. So you're also increasing your income stream and possible avenues of revenue um, while you're producing chestnuts. And so we want to be measuring that as well. Yeah, and, yeah I mean, that's what's so cool about about studies like this is that just so much of science is like so single-minded and like mm. has so much tunnel vision i don't know i just think it's really exciting that like people like y'all are doing this kind of research that's more holistic and then from the food point of view an article i just read that alan williams wrote about you know, just you know some of the stuff like it seems so obvious 
but it's not necessarily yeah. that but like how the majority of our land is like producing corn and soybeans and things for like livestock production and you know livestock feeds and biofuels and the reality is like okay you might have a thousand acres of soybeans but i think how he put it is like how many people sit down for breakfast and eat a bowl of yeah. field soybeans nobody yeah. so it's not really even food yeah and it's like a farm like this you know we're producing nuts and meats and eggs and yeah. vegetables and grains like that's like actually real food that we can eat and feed our communities with yeah and make a living like all and be feeding the wildlife and the soil life and yeah i mean that all that stuff like just seems so obvious to me but i i have to constantly remind myself that like it's only obvious to me because I've grown up on this land and like grown up with this experience. Like it's just not, that's not the reality that most people live in, so. Yeah, we talk about that all the time too because obviously everybody that works for ecdysis is very interested in this and we all say the same thing. It's like, it's so obvious. <laughs> but I think, I mean, it's like with so many things, everyone's aware, but just because you're aware doesn't mean you're gonna make the changes. And I feel like seeing hard numbers and seeing things that honestly, like I hate to say it, but affect money, that's what makes the world go round. Like that, those will be drivers of change and motivators to hopefully influence change. And I mean, health is such a huge thing. And a lot of systems that we are trying to study are, are systems that are, you are feeding your local community because that's what matters. But like, that's something else that we're measuring is nutrient density of all of these crops and saying like, it is, it's a lot healthier to be eating these things too. But um Right. Yeah. We really try and keep things focused, farmer focused and relationship based in our studies. Um, yeah. And I think that my boss started this organization because he was tired of having research come out of labs and research farms that aren't actual operations and aren't including real challenges that farmers are facing on a day to day basis. Like there's a disconnect there and we're trying to bridge that gap in the hopes that, you know, what we are producing for data will actually be useful. Right, and, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, farmers. I mean, that's so important because it's, yeah, ultimately none of this stuff could exist without that component. Like if we can't yeah. make a living doing this, then basically the only people who can farm are the ultra rich, which yeah. I don't think anybody wants the ultra rich to be the only people producing food, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's totally. not a good situation. And I think sometimes it can feel overwhelming. I mean, being based in South Dakota, um, you're driving through fields of corn and soy, and that's almost what's all around. And um, I have a coworker from Maine, and when he moved out there, he was just like driving through the country, and he was like, so none of this people are eating. You know, we're driving for like 20 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, no. It's like all fuel or feed. And... I feel like it's easy to think there's so many things that are wrong, but because everything is so interconnected, there's so many ways that like, if you change one thing, you change everything else. And the opportunity is plentiful if we look at it in the right way. So. Yeah. Yeah. That for me, like as a farm with a farmer's eye, you know, when I drive through those, you know, hundreds of miles of cropland that's that's all i can think about it's like i can't believe that yeah. this is how like the majority of all the farmland in our entire country looks like that yeah and like and it's just like a wasteland that's it's growing dead soil. yeah there's like no life other than one crop and that one crop isn't even feeding people and i so i'm just like imagining like just a, herds of cattle and sheep and yeah. chickens out there and like intercropping and all, all the stuff we're doing on a small scale like yeah. so you just can't tell me that that is the only way to feed the world like i just yeah. don't believe it <laughs> totally no i don't think that you can feed the world that way at least not in the in the right way 